Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church, and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Pastor Daniel. I'm one of the lead pastors around here. Uh, we're continuing a series called Messy Faith, which is through the life of David. And uh, I think that this story today is probably, particularly for the believer, is probably uh, one of the top like four or five most important stories in all of the Old Testament. And, and, and the reason that it's so important is probably not the reason that you think it's so important. And so I, I want to make sure we sit on a couple concepts today inside this story about King David, and, and I want to make sure that you understand by the end a couple really big things, because what's, what's going to happen is, have you, ever, have you ever heard a rumor about somebody that you already knew, and you hear the rumor, and you're like, there's no possible way that rumor's true. You ever know, you know, like, like uh, you, you hear something and you know this person well enough to understand their character and to understand uh, who they are and kind of how they behave, and then you hear something, you're like... No, no, it's just, one of the, like, like if you had a friend and all of a sudden they're, they're, they're wanted, they're implicated in a crime, right? Like, like you have somebody you know well and then all of a sudden they're like on the little poster, the wanted poster, and you're like, no, no. It, it, it's, it's a story like that with King David today where, where everything about his character says one thing and then what we begin to see is that he's implicated in almost this, this shocking moral failure that does not seem, like you, you would, if this happened to your friend, you would say, do I even know this person? Do I really, do I, did I really know the real them? It's, it's salacious, it's scandalous, it's better than any Game of Thrones TV show. And yet, at the same time, it's devastating tragedy with deadly results. And we will see God move in the story in overwhelming grace. And if you pay attention, what you'll see is actually a better understanding of how much he loves you. There's a big idea here I don't want you to miss. I'm going to repeat it over and over again as we go through this story. It's this. We rarely see our own sin, and what we don't see is killing us. We have such a blind spot when it comes to our own sin, which, by the way, a blind spot for our own sin, but a magnifying glass for everyone else's. Am I right? Huh? Yeah? 
Got to see that across the, yeah. Mm. And what you don't see is killing you. So we're in uh, 2 Samuel today, uh, almost exclusively. Uh, we've been, as we've gone through the life of David, right, he's, he's been running from Saul this whole time, and then uh, Saul is killed in a battle. David is finally able to take the throne in Israel into his rightful place. He gets to move to Jerusalem, the capital city, and begin to rule God's people uh, as God had predicted, as God had promised to David. Uh, he gets, uh, he's finally not on the run, and he's been on the run for a long time. He gets his stolen wife back, which I would imagine is a pretty big deal. Huh? I've never had my wife stolen, but it seems like it would be nice to get that returned. Uh, they're in Jerusalem now, and God is blessing the nation at an unprecedented pace. So God is blessing his rule. He's, he is fighting his enemies, winning in all these national battles around uh, Israel and at their borders. God is just bestowing blessing after blessing. And then uh, we see, in a couple chapters before this, we see him actually show compassion on Saul's family, the old king. And then last week, as Pastor Vance showed, uh, was telling us about, God actually makes a covenant with David to not only bless him, but, but to build a lineage from him of blessings. I mean, everything is going great. Now we get to chapter 11. <laughs> chapter 11, verse 1 says this, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Um, so if we're, if we're, this is chapter 11, and we go back to chapter 10, they end up in, in yet another battle. They've already uh, won multiple battles, but now they're fighting the Ammonites. They've actually been routing the Ammonites as well. We don't know why they have this little break, but they end up back uh, fighting the Ammonites again. They're gonna, basically, he sends his general and the army to kind of finish them off, and he remains in Jerusalem. Now, um, sometimes we miss this from a writing style perspective. The last uh, couple chapters have actually been a very different writing style by the author, and, and then it changes substantially here in chapter 11. I just want to point this out. It, um, this is like almost perfectly aligned, by the way, with our Bible reading plan. If you guys have been doing the Bible reading plan in a year with us, it kind of lines up pretty well with this. The last two chapters have been like high-level national events, like things that would make the front page newspaper about the country, uh, 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 who he's going to war with, and what battles he's winning, and what, what's happening, and then all of a sudden, and this, this chapter is, is going to change in terms of how the tone and how it's written and everything. The first thing is this. This chapter is going to get very personal. It shifts from national achievement to, to things about David's character. And the second thing, it's going to get very clinical. It's actually written almost completely devoid of emotion. We have all these characters we're going to meet in this story today. It doesn't tell us how any of them feel. In fact, it doesn't really even tell us how they think. It's just like, it's almost like a case report from a law enforcement officer. It's just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. That's all you're gonna see here, and yet even that is just shocking. Three themes, I want you to, if you have notes, write this down, because all of this is in this story. As you look at it, if you read through this multiple times, you'd see these different themes. Here's the first one. It is never about what we do for God, it's about who we are before God. It's never about our achievements for God, it's about our heart for him. So it's never about what we do for God, it's about who we are before God. Secondly, character always trumps competency. Always. You'll do nothing with your skills for God if your character is rotten. And until God can work on your character, the accomplishments are gonna be few and far between. And actually, if you did accomplish things with rotten character, it'd be worse for you. Character always trumps competency. And then lastly, for you folks that really love alliteration because we're Baptist, sin sneaks its start so seemingly small and subtly. <laughs> Figured you guys would enjoy. Sin sneaks its start so seemingly small and subtly. So you can take a note of, of these as we read, and you'll find these themes in here. Uh, but I want you to look at the small, subtle sin and its erosion of character, and notice the compound effect of sin. Sin never delivers joy. It only delivers more and more and more sin. Verse 2. 
It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. So he's now living in the king's house, biggest, tallest, most grandest house in Jerusalem. So his roof is above everyone else's roof. That he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Okay, first thing, uh, resting is what David's doing. Resting is healthy. There's nothing wrong with it. Breaks are healthy. Living life at a sustainable pace is healthy. But you are never on break from your personal disciplines. You rest from work. And this is David who's been on the run from Saul for a decade. I mean, he's been running for his life for years. He's been in enemy territory in the land of the Philistines, pretending to be an enemy of God, pretending to be crazy at one point, just to get away from Saul. It has been a torturous season for him. He's been in constant battles and constant conflict and constant fighting for his life and escaping the jaws of his enemies for a decade. And it's finally over, and he gets to rest, and that's a good thing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, though, says this. I love this quote. He says this. Satan does not fill us with a hatred for God, but with a forgetfulness of God. So the primary way that the devil is going to attack you once you come to Christ is not to make you hate God. He's actually going to try to get you consumed with other things in the, in the world, other things in your life, other things that suddenly seem like big priorities so that you begin to focus your energy and affection on them so much you begin to forget about God. And, and you, you've been here where you're tired. You had a season that was really hard. Like you were working hard. You're working two jobs. You're working overtime. You're working your rear end off. You've been through tragedy or trials or loss or grief. A tough season that should have lasted months, but it lasted years. You've been there. When you're getting drugged to the meat grinder of life. And then God blesses you and you get a break. You get some rest, and that is wonderful, that's honorable, that's beautiful, it's a gift from God. But you cannot, in those moments, set aside your personal disciplines in pursuit of holiness. So, so before David's conflict, when we look at his life, he played the harp and sang songs to God. He wrote songs and prayers and poems to God. He loved God's law. He studied God's law. He, he prayed and sought God's favor and his face. Th those are all things that should not have stopped happening just because he got a break from work. When, when God gives you rest, do not throw your own disciplines out. We break for rest we don't break from health. And, and, and so I, I, I looked at my own life and I realized, listen, when I get a vacation, I eat the worst. I drink the most alcohol. I sleep in the latest. I begin to waste time. What's happening? I'm not resting. I'm being a glutton. Why, do, why would I allow that? My disciplines aren't the thing I need a break from, and yours aren't either. They're the healthiest possible way for me to live life. They bless me. Christian, you, you don't need a break from pursuing Jesus. Y'all get that, right? Jesus is your rest. You don't break from that to get a rest. You don't take a break from healthy living. You need rest from work, but you don't need periods of indulgence and gluttony and call it a vacation. Because watch what's about to happen to David here. So he, we, haven't, we haven't seen him sin yet. He's just on the roof. He looks over the roof. There's a beautiful woman. It happens. It, it's going to happen to you, right? You, you, you live in this world. You're not of this world, but you're in this world. You're going to see Beautiful women, beautiful men, beautiful things. Things that are attractive. I've done CrossFit for over seven years. Trust me. There are, you got to have some eye discipline. You know what I'm talking about? You have, I have turned around and worked against the wall. I'm just working out right against the wall. Like this is the only safe place for my eyes right now. <laughs> May look weird, but I'm, I'm, I, you, you're going to have to do it. As long as the response from David is biblical, and the biblical response here would be to flee from sin, because the Bible's really clear about sexual temptation. In fact, in 1 Corinthians uh, 6.18, it says this exactly, flee from sexual immorality, run from it. Like, it's not sin yet, he just sees this beautiful woman, but guys, like, 
the Bible is so clear about sex. It is a gift for your marriage. That's it. Guard it, protect it, and enjoy it. But, but, but church, you, you have to reject everything this world will tell you about sex. And, and if you're here today and, and you're, you're, you're kind of just checking out the whole church thing, you're not really sure about Jesus or Christians or church or the Bible or any of those things yet, first of all, welcome. You are welcome here. We're glad you here. you're here. You can come as often as you like and hang out with us. We appreciate it. But secondly, just give me your, your attention for one second. When, when we're talking about the Bible and how it regards sex, and, and you may have heard about it from a friend or you may have read it once or something and you thought, man, that sounds outdated and old-fashioned and silly and, and restrictive and burdensome. But nothing in my life has wreaked damage as sexual sin. Nothing has been as damaging as sexual sin. Nothing has hurt people as deeply or faster. Nothing has led me astray from God faster than sexual sin. Nothing has led to shame faster. Nothing has pulled me from God so powerfully as sex and its temptation. There's over a decade of my life that was largely just sexual sin after sin after sin. It felt like being in a tar pit where you just can't get out no matter what you do. And if you talk to anyone that has experienced that in their life, they'll tell you that the Bible's view, perspective of sex is actually not restrictive at all. It's very liberating. There's nothing more freeing in this world than actually how the Bible defines sex because as smart as we think we are, as advanced as we think we are, as much as we love to be in control of our own lives, now even, even, even science agrees now about the health of monogamy about the danger of porn, and about the power, the, the just raw power of sex in our lives. Listen to me, God's opinion on sex is perfect because he designed it perfectly. Like we, li we live in a distorted world that uses sex in a distorted way. So if you wanna know what sex is supposed to be like, I don't know, maybe ask the creator. He made it. You see, you've all bought something and there's a label on it, right? It says use as intended. Yes? Yeah. One of you fought. Yeah, right? You, you look, use as intended. Here's the manual. The, the creator didn't leave it without instructions. Stop getting angry at the instructions. It's literally like looking at a firework and being like, please don't shoot it yourself. And you're like, old fashioned. <laughs> don't touch the saw blade. Oh, this is restrictive, guys. So what does David do? Does he run? Does he flee temptation? No, he clicks on that link. I'm gonna slide into those DMs. He sends that message he shouldn't send. He wants to see the whole profile and scroll through all those pictures. Verse three, and David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Everything should have stopped right here. That's a married woman. Married to one of his own soldiers, by the way, who's incredibly loyal. The definition of that is off frickin' limits. <laughs> if they're married, they ain't on the market, not for you. So everything in the Bible says, run, son. Run, girl. This is the run, forest, run moment. <laughs> Verse four. So David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. This is, this is David. This is the guy that God said was a man after his own heart. This is the most godly human ruler ever described in all of the Bible. The same David that a few chapters back would not dare to put his hands on King Saul now puts his, more than his hands on Bathsheba. What went wrong? 
Well, it actually went wrong six chapters earlier. If you turn from chapter 11 all the way back to 2 Samuel 5, you'll see this. Verse 12, and David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron and more sons and daughters were born to David. At the point that this, this scripture, at in, 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 in the point of chapter 5, verse 12 here, when we find out that he takes more wives and more concubines, he already has three wives. Man, how many do you need? One is pretty hard. This is where the sin starts in David's life. If you turn back to Deuteronomy 17, do you know the Bible is actually prescriptive about what kings are supposed to do and what they're supposed to be careful of? And so all the way back in Deuteronomy 17, uh, God establishes his law, and in his law he says, "If, if... You decide that you want a king. Here is the way kings of our our country will behave. And and it has warnings about not being acquiring too much material wealth because it would lead to greed. And then it says, do not take too many wives. It's right there. He knew. David was studied the law. David knew the law. David knew he was not supposed to do these things. Why is he doing this? Why is he committing sin against the Lord? And so now you have a King David who has some unknown number of wives and concubines. Concubines are essentially a wife with kind of lesser cultural rights than than a wife. He's got some unknown harem, and yet he wants another. What, what, why? And he's going to take a married woman of his own friend. What's going on? You see, we rarely see our own sin. And what we don't see is killing us. See, it's, all, it's already escalated for David. It started when he adopted this foreign standard to take many wives. So that was a foreign, uh, 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 other countries did that. That was the norm there. And he begins to break God's law and adopt those cultural standards. And that sin led him to relaxing the standard of holiness that God had. And that, that began, he began to relax the discipline around sex and temptation. And then all it took, once he relaxed, was some free time and a quick peek. And we're way down the road to adultery. This is the nature of sexual addiction. And there is a sexual addiction epidemic in this country right now. We, we think that we can relax our own discipline around sex and that we're somehow strong enough to control our emotions and feelings and not sin. Man, y'all, you ain't strong enough to go to Walmart and not sin. (laughs) And if you ask anyone that has struggled with sex addiction, they will tell you that it started with what they thought about. They will tell you that it it started with what they were consuming through their eyes and what they they were, were dwelling on in their mind. So when a, when a Christian says, I don't want to watch a show or a movie or read a book be, because it's over-sexualized, they're not trying to be self-righteous. They're saying, I'm a weak creature and I need to protect my mind. Adultery starts in the mind long before it makes it to the pants. It starts up here. What's holding your affection? What's the object of your desire? Where's your time and energy? Where's your heart? We keep reading verse four. Now she had been purifying herself from uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. This is Bathsheba. And the woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Which is kind of a big deal since her husband's at war for David. So David sent word to Joab, that's the general, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab went to Uriah, uh, sent Uriah to David. Okay, what, what's your first response when you realize you've sinned? I don't want to say that out loud, huh? Um, maybe, you got, maybe you got caught up 
a little in relaxing the rules that led to sin, and then, then that sin began to leak, oh man, that, that's something, and now you're, and you're down the road, two, three, four, five steps, and it, it, sin has compounded itself, and it's got you into a sticky situation, and all of a sudden you kind of look up, and you know, oh my gosh, it's gotten bad. And there's this moment where like realization settles on you, and this is David's chance, right? It's bad. He, he, he's taken someone else's wife. He's committed adultery. He's coveted. He's gotten her pregnant. It's his opportunity to confess, repent, make it right. And it would have been hard and it would have been painful. Because when, when sin gets a foothold, it becomes an unstoppable force in your life. In the Bible, sin is frequently compared to an apex predator. That's a predator who's not hunted by anything else. They're the top of the food chain. And that's the way the Bible talks about sin, that it is an apex predator crouching at your door or pursuing that it wants to consume you. Matt Chandler likes to explain uh, that sin starts really cute like a baby lion. You've all seen lion cubs, right? Come on, you've at least seen the Lion King. He sings and everything, <laughs> nothing. It's a, it's a cute, it's just like a big kitty. And so you, you take the, the cute little baby lion into your house and you play with it and, and everything's fine and, and it grows and then like months later your dog disappears. <laughs> and you figure it probably ran away. And so you just, you just keep on down that path of this pet until at some point your kid is gone and you think they got kidnapped. And you don't wake up until it's consumed your leg and it's eating you alive. That's the way the Bible talks about sin. You don't play with it. You don't bring it into your home. You don't leave it in the living room. You don't, you don't play and toy around with it like it's casual. The Bible talks about life and death. The only thing that stops sin once it has a foothold is repentance. In fact, the word Hebrew for this is teshuva. It means to return to God. You're, you're, you're actually re physically turning from the way you were going and, and returning to God. So you, you, you're admitting you're, you're, there's a sorrowful nature to it, but it takes action. And David doesn't do that. Instead, instead, he concocts an elaborate plan to see if he can get Uriah to go home while he's on this, he brings him back to Jerusalem, tries to trick him into going home to see if Uriah will stay with his wife and then he can cover up the origin of the baby. And when that doesn't work, he tries to get him drunk and it still doesn't work. And so when that doesn't work, because all of the, oh, what a tangled web we weave, is not working, he ends up sending a note that Uriah carries a sealed note back to the general to have him killed in the midst of battle. And he murders his friend to cover it up. And, and he is now on just a streak of running through how many of the Ten Commandments he can break in a row. He broke the ten, Tenth Commandment of coveting, which led him to break the Seventh Commandment of adultery, that led him to murder, which is the Sixth Commandment, in order to steal Uriah's wife, which is the Eighth. And, and what we're seeing is the path of sin Kent Hughes would say that the path of sin starts with desensitization towards sin, so you'll tolerate it, and then relaxation of your own personal discipline and your holiness that leads you to a fixation on something you're not supposed to have that will lead you to rationalize, so rationalization of why you should have it that finally leads to degeneration, which is sinning. And so if you think about what happened to David, he becomes desensitized to sexual sin because he's taking multiple wives. He's already beginning to break the actual law of God early on, chapters ago, and then he begins to relax his own disciplines in pursuit of God. So, so no longer is he pursuing the, God the way he was desperately when he was in the wilderness when, when Saul was right behind him and he's running for his life and he's screaming out to God, help me, help me, help me. Now things are okay, so I don't need God. And so we've relaxed our discipline and then he gets fixated on what? 
a beautiful woman. He's got a harem of beautiful women. And if that doesn't, if you can't see that analogy in our own lives about how we need a boat or another car or another job or another house or more money, I, I don't know what to tell you, but you get fixated on things and so you start to rationalize them. I literally had someone tell me that they needed to buy a $30,000 Harley because it was for ministry. <laughs> Brother, I don't, I don't think that word means what you think it means. We're great rationalizers, are we not? Oh, I got an excuse for everything that leads us to sin. This is the path of sin, is the timeless path. This is the original sin. Look, think, think about what happened in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, the midpoint of the Bible. Everything's perfect, perfect shalom, paradise. People walk with God, no death, no pain, no cancer, no end. And then Eve gets desensitized. When does the sin happen? When she's walking with God in the cool of the garden? No, when she's separated from God, away from God, cannot hear his voice. Begins to relax those, the, the very few commandments that there were from God. Is told by the serpent what? He didn't really mean that. Fixated on the one apple in a garden full of paradise. You can't eat from one tree. That's the tree I've got to eat from. Fixated. Rationalizing, but you could be like God. He just doesn't want you to have good things. This is the path for you and I across all of human history. We rarely see our own sin. And what we don't see is killing us. In the entirety of chapter 11, where we, we're reading this story, God is not mentioned once until the last verse in the chapter. So we hear about David and Bathsheba and Uriah. We hear about Joab and the servants and the soldiers, but not about God. You know, I think as often is the case in life, we, we're left wondering, where is God? Why would God allow this? Why would he allow murder? Why? I think this is a natural question that we don't ask enough. If you're reading this story, and you've been reading through First and Second Samuel, and, and we've been preaching through this, um, back up a couple weeks, David was told by his men, hey, this is your chance, go kill Saul. He, you know, he, he doesn't know you're here. And he, God stays his hand. He, he has conviction that no, I can't touch the Lord's anointed. So it's God that steps in and stops David from killing Saul. And then when Pastor Nate preached about Nabal, what was David gonna do? He was gonna run down there and kill Nabal and every man in the whole, in the whole house. And it's God sends Abigail and says, don't do this, don't sin. So over and over and over again in David's story, God has shown up, God has shown up, God has shown up, God has shown up and stopped David from sinning. Where's God? Why would he allow this? It's not like David did all the other things on his own power. We, we saw that it was the power of God. You know who wants to know where God is? Uriah's parents. Why would you allow our son to be, why? There, many of you, if not most of you, have experienced some sort of tragedy in your life. You've suffered from abuse or offense physical, sexual, verbal, at the hands of someone else, you've had death or loss, or your health has been swept away outside of your control, and you've asked, where is God? Why would he allow this? Where is his justice? Where is his goodness? I, I cannot imagine that Uriah's parents are not asking that question. And I want to answer that in just a few moments, but I want to pick up our story because we see God for the first time in chapter 11, at the very end in verse 27, he was not absent. It says this, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. God was not absent. He was allowing David the freedom of choice. We saw a chapter full of sending. David, Bathsheba, and Joab all sent messages in this chapter, and now we hear from God. He sends 
a message in the form of a messenger. In 2 Samuel 12, verse one, it says, and the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet Nathan, to David. The prophet Nathan is sent to David to expose this hidden sin that has been compounded that, that few know about and that David is actively hiding and to pull it into the public light for everyone to see. And I want you to understand that it is grace that ruthlessly exposes our sin. See, for most of you, when you're in the midst of some sin that you're hiding from other people and you don't want them to know about, your worst fear is that it would get out. No? No one else has hid sin in this room. I'm the sinner. When, 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 you're, when you're actively hiding sin, when you're actively pretending you're self-righteous and you didn't do anything wrong, your worst fear, the thing that actually begins to weigh on you is someone might find out. Someone might know. But it is grace that ruthlessly exposes our sin. It's not punishment. David's sins were only getting worse, more and more and more serious in secret. And that's when God steps in. And we call God stepping in grace. So Nathan, the prophet Nathan's going to come to David and he's going to tell him a story. He's going to say there was a wealthy man who had flocks and flocks of sheep and all of this wealth. And then there was a poor man who lived next to him who had one single lamb that he loved, his only possession. And the rich man had a guest come and instead of killing one of his own sheep to feed him, he went and stole the only possession of this poor man and slaughtered it to feed his guest. And David is going to become incensed at the injustice and he's going to say, this man deserves to die. And Nathan's going to look at him and he's going to say, you're the man. You're the man. You didn't hide your sin from God. You're the man. You see, you cannot even fully, truly repent until you understand the significance of the offense. You have to understand the injustice. Nathan tells David about a mistreatment, an injustice to to prick at his heart, to wound him, to stir up his actual conviction and emotion because he's so dead to his own sin, so numb to what he's doing, so blind to what he's been covering up that he can't see it. And so he has to use an outside example to actually get that hard heart to beat and bleed again. And once he does, then he says, that's you. That's part of grace. Gr- grace means unmerited favor, favor you don't deserve. When you're, when you're given something that you, di- you couldn't earn and you didn't earn, it's grace. But grace is not without fury because grace has anger for justice. If God did not care about sin greatly, then it would make grace worthless. So, so the opposite is true. Nothing is more furious over sin than grace. That's what makes it so valuable and priceless. Let me put it this way. If you were throwing something out in the trash can on your street, and as you threw it out, someone walked by and said, can I have that? And you said, sure. It's not like you've done much giving something to them, right? You literally took it out of the trash can and gave it to them. You're like, yeah, I'm a pretty generous person. <laughs> gave them some of my trash. You'd go, well, that's not very valuable. It didn't even mean anything to you. You're going to throw it away. This is my point. It has to mean something significant to be something significant. No one, not one of you or any human ever born has ever hated sin the way God hates sin. He hates it more than you can even imagine. It's so opposite his character, he can't be around it. It's that significant to him, which is what makes his love for you so valuable. That he would extend grace in the face of something he detests so greatly. This sin, this disobedience. And sin, no matter who it's against, is always against God first. And you're going to see this if you skip down to verse 
10 in chapter 12, when Nathan is talking about God's response, he says this to David, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. That's God talking. God's saying, your sin means you despise me, not Uriah or Bathsheba or Joab or, no, me. You sinned against me. And in 2 Samuel 12, 13, David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Why? Because all sin is rebellion against God. All offenses against other people actually are against God first. Here's why. If you don't believe me, listen. Because before you can make a claim that I have done something unjust to you, you have to tell me where the measurement of justice came from. That was unfair. By whose standards? God's. So you sinned against the man who, who made, the creator that made the actual standard of justice. You sinned against God. First, when you sin against another person for any offense. So when you, when you sleep with someone outside of the boundaries of marriage, you sin against God. When you lust after someone in your mind, you sin against God. When you covet or envy someone else's things or their life, you sin against God. When you gossip or slander, you sin against God. When you lie, cheat, steal, you sin against God. When you murder, you sin against God. You and I live in a country where all of the laws are about how we deal with other people. But before you deal with the horizontal implications of your offense, you must first deal with the vertical because he created the concept of justice. You sin against God when you sin against one another. So David's response, which we just read, I have sinned against the Lord, seems short and abrupt. But the reality is that he is cut to the heart. In a moment, we're going to read his, the song of repentance that he wrote about this very moment. It's Psalm 51. And it's the, uh, his, his short admission here is actually part of its power. Real repentance, which is what David is about to go through, is a sorrowful understanding, a total owning, no excuses, and a committed turning. Real repentance is a sorrowful understanding, a total owning, and a committed turning. According to Hebrew law, David should die for this. He has committed offenses in which the penalty written in God's law is death. According to David's own conscience, he should die. He was ready to kill the rich man who stole the the sheep. He should die. Instead, God spares his life. And yet we know someone had to pay for that sin. I told you earlier that I would answer this question. Why would God allow David to do this? Because he clearly did not come and step in like he did all those other times. And so for just a moment, I want you to just close your eyes. I want to ask you this question. I want you to consider this. Why would God allow the most holy and reverent and faithful human ruler in history to sin in the most disastrous, shameful, humiliating way. Why would he do that? He allowed David to sin in this way, to create such destruction and death in this way so that you could read this this morning. It's for you Because if the most holy, faithful man cannot overcome sin, then what chance is there for you and me? Do you see? The the weight, the curse of sin is too great. The temptation is too much. Are you greater than David? Is anyone in the room arrogant enough to read that the most holy man who is after God's own heart sin, and you're like, well, only someone like David, a little better than that. Even in our stupidity, we're not that arrogant. But the moment, the moment in your mind when, when, when you're reading this story and David commits adultery or the moment in this story where, where he covers it up with murder, the moment that, that we read that and we think, well, I wouldn't have done that. Good thing I'm not like him. Sure, I'm glad that's not a temptation for me. 
We rarely see our own sin. And what we don't see is killing us. Most of the time, the heroes in the Bible, they're, they're not us. We, we read the Bible incorrectly, but today, da- David is you. David is me. We're David in this story. When you look at another person lustfully, Jesus says in Matthew 5, you've committed adultery in your heart against God. When you get angry in your heart against a person, God says you've committed murder. I've broken every one of the Ten Commandments over and over again. I've murdered and stolen and envied, and I cheat on God every day. And that's why his grace for me is so scandalous. Because I don't deserve it. Because it's worth so much. I don't deserve any of it. And you don't either. Charles Spurgeon says, when we deal seriously with our sin, God deals gently with us. How could God forgive David if he hates sin? Where was the justice for Bathsheba? Where was the justice for Uriah? You can't just sweep it under the rug. It has to go somewhere. And this is the story of the Bible. All of the sin in the world had to go somewhere, and so it went to the cross. When God sent Jesus to save us, Jesus willingly died on the cross for every sin that ever took place or ever will take place. He took the wrath of God for our sake so we could be called sons and daughters of God. But only if you know him, only if you acknowledge him as Lord, only if you throw yourself at his feet and have a true understanding that you don't deserve any of it. Do you know him? Do you know him? For, for just a moment, and we only have moments left today, will you close your eyes and bow your head, everyone in the room? Just, I don't want you, I'm not asking you to do anything crazy or religious. I just want you to think about yourself. Just, just focus on your life and your relationship right now. Jesus died on a cross to offer you a new life today. The chance to repent, to turn from sin and be saved by him. If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ and surrendered your life to him, I want to offer you the chance to do that today. Every day you wait, you take a risk (laughs) No day is guaranteed. You're living life stuck in sin like that tar pit. The Bible says that everyone has sinned, but you can be saved if you declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord. And so if you're willing to ask him for forgiveness and for salvation and to lead your life with every eye closed, every head bowed, I just want to just do this. Repeat this prayer after me if that's something you want to do. You could do it quietly or silently. Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I'm lost on my own and I can't save myself. I know I'm incapable of living perfectly. I want you to save me. I surrender everything to you. In full confidence, I receive your promise of relationship of the forgiveness of sin, of the Holy Spirit, and of eternal life. Be my Lord, please, Jesus. With no one looking up, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time ever right now, would you be brave and just raise your hand for only me to see? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, look up here. Jesus loves you. And he wants more for your life than you could ever imagine. And if you just said that prayer, welcome to the family. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when a single person comes to Christ. We're going to do something different here at the end uh, for all of you guys. 
So Christian, you son, you daughter of the king, who has been saved by grace and yet is at this moment in rebellion to God, you are, a call, you are called to repentance every single day. It is said that uh, good leaders don't simply teach, they model. I read a, a phenomenal quote by an old Scottish preacher today. Uh, he died before the age of 30, but, but his impact on the world was absolutely amazing. He said this, his name was Pastor McChain. My people's greatest need is my personal holiness. As one of your pastors, the greatest thing that I'll ever be able to do for you is to continually tell you how often I mess up and run to God, daily, hourly. There's no graduation from confession and repentance. It's the most liberating thing in the world to know I can run and throw myself at Jesus' feet. We rarely see our own sin, and what we don't see is killing us. For just a moment, I want you to think about the last time you had to go to someone and ask for forgiveness. The last time you had to go to God and repent of your behavior, of your thought life, of, of a sin in your life you became aware of. The most dangerous outcome in this world is to have a heart that has become hardened to God. That is a death sentence. This is why we have community. This is why we get into small groups. This is why we let people in close in our lives because they call out the blind spots we don't see. We're going to end today by reading the first 12 verses of Psalm 51, which is a psalm that King David wrote in repentance. And so um, if this, if you, if, you are, if you are hiding something in your life, running from God, it is just the most beautiful prayer that you should be making to God today. And we're going to read this together out loud. So everyone stand up, and we're going to read this together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. If you'll remain standing, we're going to sing our closing song about Psalm 51. Our elders and prayer team are going to be up here. If you want prayer for any reason, you can come forward. If you said that prayer just moments ago, there are some people waiting for you at the tables in the back that say, I raised my hand. We would love to talk to you about what it looks like to take a next step of faith with Jesus Christ. You move as the Lord leads you, church. I love you.